Hello and uh, welcome. This is the 2024 American Psychiatric Association annual meeting, Psychiatric News Highlights video series. I'm uh, Dr. Adrian Preda, the Editor-in-Chief of Psychiatric News. My guest today is Dr. Jyoti Patak. Uh, Dr. Patak, we are meeting uh, uh, following uh, your very interesting presentation during our uh, uh, news uh, brief uh, on words matter use of stigmatizing language in clinical notes of patients with opioid use disorder. So first, uh, can you share some information about your background and how, you, how did you become interested uh, in this uh, topic? Great, thank you, Dr. Prada, for the kind invitation. Um, so I'm a professor in population health sciences and in psychiatry at Cornell Medicine. Uh, I've been uh, trained as a computer scientist, uh, but I joined my postdoctoral fellowship at Mayo Clinic, which is when I got into the field of psychiatry. Uh, and most of my lab's work focuses on looking at large electronic medical record data sets, insurance claims data sets to study depression and substance use. So we have been looking at treatment outcomes and looking at health services utilization uh, using these large data sets. But we were recognizing that a, a big component of these analysis is to first of all understand which patients are actually accessing treatment, how, what challenges they have, what barriers they have in accessing care. Uh, and for those who are, what is the role of stigma uh, that we may see whether in their clinical encounter, in the clinical documentation process that might lead towards negative outcomes. And so that led to this particular study where I think uh, research after research has shown that uh, huge disparities exist in, in providing mental health care. And a small but not an insignificant component of uh, disparities is how we document clinical encounters, how we document uh, patients' feelings, how we document what, uh, what has happened during an encounter uh, and, and that's sort of led us to uh, understanding uh, some of the issues in this analysis. Mm -hmm. Very important questions. I think very pertinent clinical questions that could certainly affect uh, not only how we perceive the patients, but how care is delivered. So how did you decide to, uh, to, uh, to have a better understanding of uh, uh, the st stigma representing um, labels in medical records? Right. So, um, great question. And I, I think, again, studies have shown that uh, when patients observe stigmatizing language in their own medical records, and with 21st Century Secures Act, patients have access to their own, own records, uh, it can lead towards negative attitudes, either towards the clinician. There has been research that has shown that it might also lead towards uh, poor adherence to treatments. Um, and so we were, first of all, motivated by the work that NIDA, the National Institute of Drug Abuse, has done in using appropriate language uh, when engaging with patients with substance use disorders or addiction and how that might manifest in clinical documentation. So NIDA has developed a, a list of terms that should be avoided during conversations and replaced by particularly first-person language mm -hmm. uh, during clinical encounters. So we started essentially with, uh, uh, NIDA has this list to essentially create in this, in this case, a natural language processing algorithm. Um, so these are algorithms that can parse millions of clinical encounter notes and identify, in this case, stigmatizing terms. So we started with uh, taking this NIDA's list and adding additional terms, uh, developing different permutations and combinations and in this particular study, we looked at our own Cornell patients who may have been diagnosed with substance use or opioid use disorder uh, between 2010 and 2023. This was a large sample. So we just mm -hmm. randomly selected about roughly 2,700 patients. Uh, and that led to around 1 million clinical notes. Uh, and we processed all of these uh, clinical encounter notes through our algorithms. And as I shared during the press briefing, we first of all observed uh, and confirmed what the literature has already reported. So patients who are black, who are Hispanic, they had higher rates of stigma language in their clinical documentation. Uh, when, and terms like addict, alcoholic, 
these were highly prevalent abuser, these were highly prevalent in all the clinical documentation. But what was surprising to us is that compared to other medical specialties, we observed higher rates of stigma language use in notes that were documented by social workers. So all social work notes had very high prevalence of stigma language. Uh, it was somewhat counterintuitive because we would, we would hope that documentation uh, by social workers is more, uh, has more empathy and the right terminology is being used, but that was not what we observed. Very interesting. Uh, so you, you gave uh, some example of stigmatizing uh, language that had been compiled by NIDA. Um, so what would be the, the recommended language to use that you'd hope to see as replacing the stigmatizing language? Absolutely. I think NIDA provides some examples of the right terminology to use. So for example, instead of um, labeling someone as alcoholic, the right terminology is person who might be using alcohol. So mm -hmm. first person language use. So NIDA already provides some examples of this. And there is also continuing medical education training that NIDA provides uh, to train clinicians uh, in appropriate language documentation during their clinical encounters. But this also actually, in, in my mind, is an opportunity where informatics and artificial intelligence-based technologies could really be beneficial. Um, because with the right set of algorithms that could be embedded in medical record systems, it can recommend clinicians that you should not use this term or this is an inappropriate language and should be replaced by more appropriate language. Mm -hmm. So as these machine learning and AI technologies develop down the line, I think there is a huge opportunity and potential in how they could be deployed in this particular setting. In other words, uh, uh, to have maybe something similar uh, to word correction, but it's going to, to indicate that the language used is stigmatizing and, and uh, then offer alternatives. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and to our knowledge, there are already some preliminary studies that others have done. Um, and I think it has shown very promising results. So that's a very active area of work that we are also working. Mm -hmm. Along with the same line, I think there's also opportunity for clinician training uh, in appropriate use of stigma language and non-stigmatizing language. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's where also there is opportunity for AI-based tools to facilitate micro-learning. So just-in-time micro-learning um, that could be beneficial uh, in appropriate documentation. Definitely. So I'm curious, you talked about the differences between the type of providers. That was one of the findings. Um, any other differences with regards to maybe um, older, younger physicians or other demographics that, that were different? Yes, that's a very, very great question. And, and we have not uh, looked at that data yet, but that is something that we are actively exploring. So when they received training, uh, we have looked at provider specialty but we have not looked at the provider setting where the clinical encounter happens. So for example, do we see higher use of stigma language in encounters that are in emergency room versus let's say in an outpatient mm -hmm. setting? So that's the next phase of analysis we are doing and also uh, pr provider characteristics. Um, I, um, uh, I'm curious about um, uh, between DSM and, and ICD, as, as you know, there are some diagnostic differences when it comes to substance use disorders uh, following DSM-4 in the fifth edition and text revision that we currently use, we no longer have substance dependence or substance abuse as a DSM diagnosis, but this diagnosis continue to exist in the ACD classification. Right. Um, did that uh, uh, play any role, could have played any role in your findings? No, I, that's a great question, and I think it may have. And, and as I also shared during the press briefing, the algorithm that we have created is our version one, maybe version 0 0.1 of what we have, and it is not smart enough to sort of detect these types of nuances. The, the next set of algorithms that we are developing are going to use uh, large language models, and so there's lots of open source technology that we are leveraging right now where you will be able to detect these nuances between what DSM terminology versus what ICD-10 um, codes might have, uh, might have been implicated. And we also see that um, 
in many of the medical record data sets, there is templated language that's being used. Mm -hmm. And so as of now, our algorithm is not smart enough to detect what the clinician actually documented versus what the template was. Uh, but going forward, we hope to actually fix that uh, issue. And so then we can be very confident that it is actually a provider documentation as opposed to what might have been templated. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like one of the conclusions here would be that it would be useful actually to also maybe revisit some of these templates exactly. in terms of like how they represent exactly. uh, the language and, uh, and uh, uh, that there are pr probably uh, alternative design possibilities to decrease the risk of bias that's, that's embedded in the template. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that. And the, the other part that we are also interested to see is that, of course, our goal is to eventually help our patients and look at uh, they have good treatment outcomes. So we are trying to understand how persistence stigmatizing language use could lead towards, for instance, poor treatment referral. Uh, poor treatment adherence. And so that's an area that we are also very much actively working. This is all very interesting. And I could imagine that uh, um, another potential application would be to look at correlates between clinical outcomes and uh, use of uh, stigmatizing language. Uh, intuitively, we believe, and I think we have also data, that uh, a stigmatizing type of encounters tend to decrease the quality of the rapport, which is actually essential when we look at treatment outcomes. Right. Absolutely. I think the, the therapeutic relationship between the clinician and the patient will, I, we hope, will improve as language usage becomes more and more non-stigmatizing. Based on your findings, um, any, uh, any recommendations for our clinical colleagues <laughs> out there? Well, I think it's fair to say that our findings are very preliminary in nature. This is just a small sample of data that we have looked at just from one health system. So clearly more validation is required. I think at this stage, uh, the recommendation that I may, may like to offer is for clinicians to be aware that uh, these, your words do matter. Words have consequences. So when we are trying to document a particular clinician patient encounter, at least in the back of the mind, it's very important mm -hmm. to, to make sure that we are not using words uh, who might, that might lead to even more stigma inducing. These patients are already in a very difficult state of their life. Um, let's not make it more worse. Any final thoughts, Dr. Patak? Well, first of all, Dr. Prada, thank you so much for the kind invitation. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I think as I mentioned in the press briefing, this is a very new space of work. And quite frankly, that's where I see the role of AI uh, being a, a huge innovator uh, in this area. As I'm sure throughout this meeting, a lot of there's lots of sessions about digital technology and AI, and there is admittedly good concerns about how AI could lead towards bias, could lead towards more disparities uh, in our patient population. Uh, but I strongly believe that this is an area where AI can be of good. Uh, with the right set of technologies and tools, we can really uh, facilitate clinical documentation that is non-stigmatized, that is more inclusive, and that is more culturally adaptive. And we hope that the work that we are doing is a small contribution in this space. So I'm very optimistic. I think that uh, your work is very important uh, and I think it's very exciting to think about potential uses of the AI, which is the new frontier. First, in terms of better understanding what we are doing yeah. and then uh, use it uh, as a way of actually decreasing bias. So I thank you for your great work uh, and I thank you for participating in this dialogue today. Great. Thank you so much. It's thank my you. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.